Welcome to the International Sunday School lesson for Sunday, January 29th, 2023. The title of this lesson in Boyd's commentary and Towson's Press International Sunday School commentary is God Promise to Be Present. Now for the adult topic, the title is Promises of Restoration and Gladness. Hey, if you enjoy our lessons, please let us know by liking, commenting, subscribing, and hitting the little bell to be notified when we post each week. To find out more about Jordan Christian Center, a virtual ministry aiming to transform lives by equipping, educating, empowering, as well as encouraging the world, please visit us at jordanchristiancenter.com. Hey, I'm Minister Adam, and Sunday School is now in session. Let's get to our lesson. But before we do that, let's start with a moment of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you today giving you glory, honor, and praise, Lord. Lord, we lift your name on high, and we thank you, Lord, for your continuously uh, re rescuing us and restoring us back with you, Lord. Lord, guide us as we go through your lesson, and we will give you all the glory, honor, and praise. And it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's get into our lesson. Our scripture be coming from the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 21 through 27, and we'll be in the New King James Version of the Bible today. Now, the main thought I'll be coming from the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 27, which reads, Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. Now, the aim of our lesson is by the end of this lesson, we will contrast the prophet's threats to God's promised restoration. Explore the feelings that accompany words of threats with words of restoration and offer a prayer of thanks to God for his restoration. Now, as we do each week, we'll start with a little bit of background. We're now in the ninth lesson of the second quarter in the unit titled God Promises. And this week's lesson is coming out of the book of Joel. Now, the book of Joel was written by Joel, who's considered a minor prophet. Now, he's considered this not because uh, his word is not from God or any less important than any of the other prophets, simply because of the length of his three-chapter book. Now, little is known about the specific context of Joel's writing, but many believe that it was written to the Jewish people living throughout Judah during the reign of King Joash. They, they were witnessing ungodly leadership and their neighbors, their military conquest from their northern enemies, as well as God's judgment through natural means such as locusts and, and barren land. Joel referred to many of these events in his writing, uh, using them to call the people to repent and return to God and his ways. Now, this three-chapter book start with the focus on the experiences that were currently happening to the Jews, uh, as you originally wrote this. Now, many believe that the Jews had returned from exile during this writing, and he's referring to what's happening to them at that time. He refers to the plagues of locusts upon the land as, as that being a judgment from God. He insists to the Jews that they need to understand that their judgment came from God and it was a call for them to repent for their ways. This repentance was to begin with the priests, nonetheless. They were to fast and, and there were a call for them to do something that they seldomly do, which was to assemble. Joel also noted that the day of the Lord was near. Leading up to our lesson today, in chapter two, Joel transitioned to spiritual themes beyond their immediate situation in the beginning part of chapter two. It, 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 because of the day of the Lord was near, he said the Jews should sound the alarm and an army would soon invade and the people were to repent to God. Their repentance should include fasting, weeping, and mourning. The theme at the end of chapter one is repeated at the beginning of chapter two in calling the people to consecrate themselves before God. Joel reinforced the fact that despite bad things were taking place during their time, the Lord will make all things right. This would include a physical and spiritual blessing that will be given to the people of God. 
And this is where our lesson picks up today in Joel chapter 2, verse 21 and 23, which says, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, you beast of the field, for the open pasture will spring up, and the trees bear its fruit, and the fig tree and wine yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you former rains faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you and the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Here we find Joel continue to explain how God will reverse the curses placed on Judah and restore their fortune when God, uh, why? Because God is zealous for his land and he pity his people. You'll find that in verses 18 and 20 of chapter 2. This likely referred to the end of age. Now, although it has been seasons in, in Judah and Israel that they have been prosperous, but since the time of exile, we find that the restoration was incomplete and um, Israel's Israel, it, enemies had not be fully vanished at that time. As a matter of fact, God here is addressing three entities within a nation. He's addressing the land, the wild animals of the field, and the inhabitants or the people of Zion. So after the land and people had been uh, avenged by uh, or, or ravaged, I should say, by invaders, Joel reassures them that God will have mercy on them and restore their blessings in the future time. And it's because of, of, of God's promises that would never fail, not because of them, but because God is faithful in, in what he does. They're the one that broke the covenant, but God is faithful and allow them to make a U-turn and, uh, and repent. And if they do that, God will bless them and restore their land. So as Joel is talking about these things, he's speaking um, these things in anticipation of the Israelites' repentance to God. First, Joel commanded that, that it said that the land, it says, do not fear, O land, rejoice and be glad. The land is earlier mentioned to be mourning because of the invaders. They had destroyed the vegetation, leaving it desolate and barren. We find this in Joel chapter 1, verse 10. The plague has caused fear and terror in the land. Here, however, the prophet commanded that the land replaces fear with rejoicing and gladness. The reason, he said, is that God has done great or marvelous things. This speaks to the great things that God will do to uh, restore Israel in the past tense. Why is this important? Because it shows what certainty that God will restore Judah. It, see, in chapter one, God used this same approach to show the certainty of his judgment, which they currently face. The Almighty God, it, it says he's zealous for his land in Joel chapter eight, ver, chapter two, verse 18. This means God will not let the land stay desolate, that he will reverse the ecological damage and allow the land of Judah to produce fruit once again. Now, it's likely that this prophecy had been in part of numerous of times since the time of Joel, but the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy will come in the millennial kingdom where Jesus sat on the throne in Jerusalem and dwells in the land. Secondly, Joel addressed the, the wild animals or the beast of the fear who lived on the land. He said to them, don't fear, beast of the fear, like the land of Judah. The beast of the fear were, were greatly affected by the judgment that was on the people of Judah. They, they were distressed because there were no pastures for them. The water brooks had dried up and, and fire devoured the pastures in, in, in the wilderness. So now the, pro the prophet exalted them with hope. He's given them hope at this time because the pastures um, for, the wild, for the wilderness will turn green. This means that is be, the land will become fertile again. That God will allow the land to prosper. And when the land prosper, the beast and the animals in the field who consume the land will prosper as well. Now, here's the thing. When you find in the Bible green, green has two meanings in the Bible. Green is the color of vege uh, vegetative life, and it, it, it um, denotes beauty and abundance. More than any other color, green portrays nature from its ideal form. 
So throughout the scripture, green is used as a positive sense to represent abundance and fertility. Similarly, green is a sign of God's favor and provision. The prophet Jeremiah, for example, tells us that the one who places his trust in God will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its root by a stream and will not fear when he come, but his leaves will be green and it will be, it will not be anxious in the year of drought nor cease to yield fruit. We find this in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 8. So in chapter one, it seemed like God intended to send drought in addition to the invasion of other um, countries to Judah. Now, as a result of this, we find that the beasts were, they, they, had, they were in agony. I mean, they were lost. Similarly, Joel told the Jews that the pastures of, uh, of the wilderness would turn green when God restored their fortune. The wild animals will have plenty of grass to eat, and they're no longer grown for more. As they would be in the land of Judah, um, before the it was devastated, God will bring all of that back. This would also be food in abundance for even humans, because trees and, 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 and the different plants, they bore fruit. Even a fig tree and the wine will yield full. That means that it will be an agricultural prosperity in the land of Judah. Why? Because God will restore them to their formal fortune. But thirdly, Joel addressed the sons of Zion and urged them to rejoice and be glad in the Lord their God. See, Mount Zion is on the eastern part of the city of Jerusalem. It is the original location of the city of David. So it's, it is a symbol of the seat of power of the kingdom. It was used here to refer to the entire land of Judah. Now, the reference of son of Judah, it actually means all those in Israel who was grieving over the destruction caused by the locusts that we, uh, that Joel mentioned in verse uh, chapter 1, verses 5, 8, 11, and 13. So we find here in the first chapter where Joel described devastation uh, uh, that was affected by the plagues of locusts. Now, he, the, the people are to have gladness and, and joy because they were cut off, but now God is restoring them. Now he inviting the Jewish people to rejoice because God has given them the early reign of vindication. In other words, God will restore all that was taken away from them. Now, when we look at this, the word vindication is also mentioned in translation as righteousness or justice. The idea is something actually finally lines up according to his proper standards. The idea seemed to be that God will restore Israel's climate, his land, his people, as well as his animals back to their proper standard. This will be, this infer that God has a, a standard for the climate and, and sometimes it's altered um, due to the judgment that God gives his people. It is altered as God purposed it for it to alter. Now think of this for a moment. Jesus sees the wind and the storm on the sea. God has the power over the wind, over nature and everything involved in it. So when God restored the earth after being de destroyed, even in the flood, we find that God made a promise. Prom he promised that the earth would no longer be destroyed by water again, that there will be a cycle of four seasons on earth as long as it remained. So God here is telling them that he will send rain to his people and to the land, and the land will become fruitful and will once again be in harmony with the beast and with the people. God will show mercy to them, not because they are righteous, but because of his graciousness, he's, his compassionate, he's slow to anger, and his abundance and loving kindness. Now, as we move down to verses 24 and 25, Joel told the Jews the results of God's mercy. Verse 24 and 25 reads, the thrashing floor shall be full of wheat and the vat shall overflow with new wine and oil. And I will restore you the years of the swarming locust that has eaten the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, my great army, which I sent among you. Here we find that as a result of the early and the late rains that we mentioned in um, verse 23, the thrashing floors will now be full of grain and the vats will overflow with new wine and new oil. 
Now, the thrashing floors is a reference to a hard level surface in which harvest grains were spread out so they can separate the stock from the husk. Now, the term that refers to a large tank designed to hold liquid. It refers to a hole at like an, in the excavated um, rock to receive the juices from the grapes, which would then be pressured and, and go into the wine press. The new wine would indicate a, a fresh um, pr production of wine, wine rather than the old wine that had been stole from the previous harvest. He's saying here that God will give them new wines every year. The picture of the thrashing floor can be, uh, it's a, it would be full of grain, the vat overflowing with new wine and oil. It makes it clear that it will be a time in Judah's economic history that prosperity will return. Why? Because God will show them favor. How? Because they repent for their sins. The Lord then spoke to, to summarize this, res, uh, this um, restoration here. He summarized the blessing as a reverse of the disaster that Joel previously described in chapter 1, verse 4, where he declared that when I make up to you for the years of the swarming locust that has eaten, um, the creeping locust, the, the stripping locust, and the gnawing locust, my great army which I sent among you. Let's break this down a little bit because here we have a little bit of imagery here. See, the locusts represent a human army that had ravished the land of Judah. Joel once again mentioned these, these four types of locusts that he, he mentioned here. He also mentioned these in Joel chapter 1 verse 4. These most likely represent the four kingdoms that would inv evade um, Judah, starting with the Babylonian invasion that happened in five. 86 BC. Now, presuming that these four kingdoms were the same four kingdoms predicted in the book of Daniel, the four types of locusts actually represented the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. So the ultimate fulfillment of the end of the age will be when the Messiah is set up upon this earth. Note here that even though God sent these judgment of four types of locusts or armies against these sinful people, God promised to repair what these armies actually devoured. And God could do this because they were his army and they were subject to his will as well. Now, the phrase, I will restore you, brings to mind the law that, that instructs someone who has violated another person's property rights to pay restitution. We find this in Exodus chapter 22. But in this case, God has not wronged anyone. It is, it, it was, God was just in judging them because they were wrong. Yet, in his compassion and his grace, God promised to make restitution to those who didn't deserve it. Just like we find in the story of the prodigal son, whom the son had returned and, and he was made whole for all the things that he had lost that he did in, in his foolishness and his sinful ways. Yet the father took him back into the family with all gladness and rejoice. As we turn back to God, God takes us back with all gladness and rejoice as long as we confess our sins. Here, Joel is telling them that they need to repent for their sins and God will restore them to where they once were. Listen, we serve a God that even when we sometimes suffer for what we've done, God in his grace and mercy will restore us when we repent. He allow us to get up and get back in line. And everything that the devil stole while we were knee deep in our sin, God telling them back then and us right now, he can give it back to us. What a mighty God that we serve. Now, as we look at verse 26 and 27, God reminds them back then and us right now that he will be present as we go through the things that we go through. It reads, you shall eat with plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wonderfully with you and my people shall never be put to shame. When you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, I am the Lord your God and there is no other, my people shall never be put to shame. So God is saying, not only will he send the grain, the wine, the oil to help his people, the land and the beast, they will have plenty to eat at that time and they'll be satisfied. 
This word satisfy here is important. It actually reminds me of Haggai chapter one, verse six, when God said, you have planted much, but harvest little. You have ate, but you're not satisfied. You drink and you're still thirsty. You put on clothes, but cannot keep warm. You um, earn wages, but they disappear as if you're putting them into pockets filled with holes. So this satisfaction of the Jews mentioned in Haggai was not because of lack of provision. Because we find in that verse shows that the provisions were there. Their dissatisfaction came from a lack of obedience. Without obedience, we can never be satisfied. We can have all the money in the world. We can have all the food we desire. But we will never truly be satisfied unless we have God in our life. And the only way God would draw near to us when we are obedient. So here we find with Joe, uh, he says, God provisions will provide for them and coupled with their obedience of the people, it leads to them being satisfied. It means they will be content and they will be pleased. Now, this is a time when they have plenty to eat until they are, until they are content and they can't give anybody the glory, honor, and praise but God. See, some of the problems that the Israelites had was when good harvest come in, they would worship the, the, the small G God of the earth or the small G God of the grain or the small G God of, of, of many different things as they made instead of getting God all the glory, honor, and praise. But the Bible tell us when we seek first the kingdom, all of these things will be added unto us. And this is what Joel is getting to the people here. When they repent and they seek after God and what God desires for their life, God will heal their land. God will cause the beast of the field to have what they need. And moreover, the people will have enough of everything to the point where they're satisfied. See, by his actions, the Lord glorifies his power and shows that he can relieve his people in their, from their distress and that he will do it when they repent. So even though their sin was great, God's mercy is greater. Even though our sin may stretch wide, God's forgiveness, mercy, and grace is greater. See, God deals graciously with these poor sinners here who return to him. But first, they must acknowledge that he has dealt wonderfully with them. In other words, they have to recognize God has done great things. How do we do that today? We can recognize that God has done great things because we're still here right now. We can recognize that God has done great things because we deserve death. But because of Christ, we have eternal life. God has done great things. See, the Israelites at this point will no longer need to be ashamed of their circumstances as they suffered through drought and famine and the attacks of their enemy, especially when they supposed to be the people of God. But God said, my people shall never be put to shame. Why? Because God will deal wonderfully with them. God will deal with them and be gracious and mercy will be shown upon them. In other words, God will restore them to their covenant position and they will never be put ashamed. When we look at verse 27, God spells out the purpose for which he would restore Judah's blessing uh, and being able to restore them from the wave of locusts or invading kingdoms. And he did this in four parts. First of all, in verse 27, it says, thus you will know that I am in the midst of Israel. This is the point of our lesson today about God's presence. Here, the covenant people would recognize that God has not abandoned them. They will return to God and know that he is Lord. They will recognize that he is in the midst of them in part because of he is faithful to his promise. So even though God is faithful, he's always faithful. I'm sorry, even though God is merciful, he's always faithful to keep his part of the covenant with the Israelites. This is very important because we find that he, God said that they will get blessings when they obey and do his will, but when they don't, there will be curses. But the one thing God did not do is leave them. So whether they're blessed or cursed, God said he will still be with them. Even today, God tells us he will never leave us 
nor will he forsake us. The next thing God said in verse 27 is that I am the Lord, your God. Well, what's the difference? What's the difference between Lord and a God? See, God is to address the creator and the ruler of the universe, the supreme being. Even the devil know who God is. But Lord means master or ruler, the one who is in charge, the one who leads someone. Therefore, it's only when we recognize God as our Lord, as our master, as our ruler whom we obey, that we become his children, that we will see his grace and mercy upon our life. So when Judah recognized uh, God as their Lord and follow him, and, and they, they handle their part of their covenant relationship with God, which is to be faithful and obey him, God will certainly show up for his part and make sure they have all the provisions that they need, guard them day and night, and make sure that they're never put to shame. The next part of verse 27 says, there will be no other. So here, Judah would acknowledge that God is God alone and he is the only true God. And besides him, there is no other because no other so-called God could restore the blessings to his people. No other God can bring forth the rain in a time of famine and a time of, of desolence in the land so they can recognize there's no other God. And then last but not least in 27, uh, verse 27, he says, my people would not be put to shame. God people will never suffer shame and humiliation from the plagues and the locusts and so on and so forth. In other words, God will take care of his covenant people and restore their reputations with other nations, and he will help them and restore them back to their former glory. When they, and this is importantly, they truly turn to him in faith and repent from their sins. In other words, God said that he would never leave them nor forsake them as well. No, and, and, and here's the thing. We have to know that God is never God that leave them. It's never God that leave us. We're the one that we turn to our own desire, our under, understanding and our own will. So in turn, we leave God. He will not leave us. So in conclusion, brothers and sisters, as he did with the Israelites, God calls us to turn from our sinful ways and return to him. In Revelation 5, uh, 2, 5, as the apostle John wrote to the church of Ephesus, he said, remember therefore from whence thou art falling and repent and do the first works or else I come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place except thy repent. See, each of us must examine ourselves to see if there's any area in which we need to return to God, any area that, that we're still um, depending on someone else other than God. Because the Lord is merciful, merciful, but he will not allow us to continue in our wayward ways without suffering the consequence. The time to turn back is now. And this week's lesson should help us see the value of repentance and the importance of knowing that God is in our midst. See, if we are in, in, in the darkness of sin, we can anticipate a divine judgment. However, the door of repentance is always open because God promised his presence. It leads us to a brightness of divine hope for all eternity. Like the Israelites, the choice is up to us. It's as if God is saying, you can get with this or you can get with that. Amen. Brothers and sisters, until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord face shine, uh, shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn towards you and give you peace. Hey, I'm Minister Adam, and you have a blessed week.